Hi, my name is Dr. Richmond Lowe and I'm the fish vet. Today, we've been called out to attend to a bleeding tumour from a giant gourami. It's had this lesion on its face for quite some time, but um, just yesterday, I think it probably knocked itself and it started bleeding. So what can be a problem with tumours in fish is that sometimes you can get um, pain every time it knocks it. The portals of infection for bacteria and fungal infections and also it can spread uh, in goldfish in particular sometimes if the tumor grows too big and or particular or any other fish for that matter it can cause buoyancy problems because it can give them a slight imbalance in the way that they swim it can cause problems with their buoyancy so we'll go in and investigate uh, what's wrong with our giant gourami here uh, we've got the lights off at the moment trying to keep him calm and see if we can catch him without too much of a struggle or a splash. I think there's going to be a struggle or a splash. Yeah. <laughs> oh, good job. All right, just put him straight in. Oh. Yeah. Whoa. Oh, and upside down or? <laughs> uh, yep. And just leave the net up there. Yep. Good job. <laughs> My eyes feel sedated already. <laughs> So here we've already put our giant gourami patient into an anesthetic bath. He will take a while to um, go under. And we'll have a close examination of his tumour here. You can see that it has uh, been quite damaged. It is uh, swelling on the right part where the nostrils would normally be. And looks like it's quite painful. What we're going to do now is just going to get his body weight so that we can measure out what amount of drugs that we're going to give him. We're going to give him some antibiotics because that is going to be a huge uh, lesion once we remove the tumour and also some anti-inflammatory so because that will definitely be a painful uh, procedure to remove that big lump from his face. 4.7 with the neck, we're going to subtract the weight of a wet net. Yes, 3.8. Here we're drawing up some anti-inflammatories because removing a tumor from the face area, there's going to be a lot of nerve endings. So we're just going to give him some painkillers while he's sedated and not quite under surgical anesthesia. Uh, we can give our injections. We're giving the anti-inflammatories intramuscularly through the epaxial muscles. Uh, this will enable it to spread systemically giving its effects quite immediately. Next we're going to give the antibiotics and because removal of this lump is going to leave quite a big area where there could be potential for bacterial infection so it is quite a large volume that we're going to be giving so we're going to give it intraperitoneal or intracelomically between entering between the ventral fins and the anus. Here we're taking our patient and placing him on our surgical table. Our table's on the floor because that's how I like to operate. The bed is actually made of or it's actually a garbage bag with a soft dry towel inside that way it doesn't compact when it gets wet. We're making the first incision here and you can see it is quite a bleeder and we find that the tumor actually goes in quite deep so I'm having to dig quite deep in there um, you can see he's, he's reacting uh, as my blade goes in. Uh, it is not due to pain because I've tested the deep pain sensation by pinching on its tail. So this is going to be due to direct mechanical stimulation of a nerve. Because this tumor goes quite deep into the head area, we're going to use cryosurgery applicator that I'm using is actually designed to remove warts from humans. Here I am using it to remove the tumor from the fish. The reason why I'm using cryosurgery is because the scalpel blade isn't able to completely remove all the tumor tissue because of the bony structures that are around the area. <coughs> uh, with cryosurgery it's able to freeze the tissues or the soft tissues 
and follow the tracks of the tumor along. How cryosurgery works is that it will freeze the cells and form ice crystals and as the ice crystals thaw it will cause disruption and breaking of the cell membranes causing cell death. You can see it is quite a bleeder. Uh, we have tried using electrocautery but it did help stop the bleeding for, for a bit of hemostasis but not quite fully enough. So what I'm doing here, I'm dabbing the defect with a sponge that has soaked up a saturated solution of potassium permanganate. Once we've achieved hemostasis and it's not bleeding anymore, we're going to apply our fish bandage which is a paloxima gel and we are alternating with dilute solution of antibiotics. At this stage of the recovery for the giant gourami is that because he's an air breather, uh, what can happen is that he will try to swim up to gulp air. So during the recovery phase, we want to keep him near the water surface and um, support him there uh, so that he doesn't just suddenly swim up and knock the glass or his head and cause more trauma or even break the tank for that matter. This big crater that we've created in his nose is going to heal by second intention healing uh, is where the tissues will sort of grow in from the bottom up and fill up that cavity. Here we position a water pump to flush fresh clean water past its gills to get rid of any anesthetic that's still in the system. Yeah, he's okay now. <laughs> What? Okay. He's a pretty chill fish. He doesn't go on the swim. I was wondering why you wouldn't wake up. Yeah, but he's already awake. Possible causes for a lump on a gourami. I'll be thinking of either fish mycobacteriosis, which is a disease that humans can catch or a cancerous mass, which can be malignant or benign. So it is important to send this lump off for testing so that we can know how to manage the situation and what other modes of intervention we need to do. So we've processed the sample for histology and here in the picture is the mass. In the top right hand is the epithelium or the skin of the fish which is normal and deep and as we go deeper down into the lump towards the bottom and left corner you can see there are heaps of fibrous tissue and vascular tissue that contains blood and also these blue ribbons of cells. In the next picture, what you'll see is a close up or a zoom in view of these cells. These cells have a tall column, columna shape to them and with sort of a, a bit of mucinous material, maybe microvillus border and then you can also see more clearly there is hemorrhage as well as a lot of vascular tissue in there so this pattern or shape of these cells makes me believe that it's an part of the olfactory tuft uh, it is well differentiated which means that it's going to be a benign tumor here we're looking at an entire cross section of the tumor on inspection of the edges of the cut section of the tumor you can see that these cells extend past the cut borders so it could be possible that we may have left a few tendrils of these or roots of these cells left uh, deep in his nasal cavity we tried to mitigate that by using cryotherapy so that the freeze spray can cause damage and death of these tumor cells uh, deeper than what we can cut. So hopefully it, we would have got all of the tumor out. Well, that's all from me now. Thank you for watching. Make sure you subscribe to get updates of our future videos and have a fantastic week.